Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great episode of the Wealth Preservation Podcast. I am your co-host, Josh Saunders, and always joined uh, by my uh, co-host, Mark Scyther. How are you today? Uh, doing fantastic. Uh, really excited about the guest we have on. We have Chris Shuba again. Uh, we heard about Chris's story of becoming an entrepreneur, but now we get to get into the mathy, nerdy stuff of what quantitative analysis is. Um, and no, it's not that thing from the Avengers movie. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's 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 actually real. Well, I guess quantum theory is real, but whatever. You know what I mean. So, Chris, <laughs> see, I'm already confused. No myself. quantum theory today. I promise you, no quantum theory today. <laughs> Uh, we're diving into the quantum realm with Chris Shuba. So, Chris, how's yep. it going? <laughs> good, good. Yep, beautiful day. We're going to knock this out of the park. It'll be fun. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, 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 Chris, let's start off real quick. Give us a quick two-minute spiel on what Helios is and what it does, right, on the quantitative side and also on the estate planning side. Yeah, so uh, real quick, uh, easy explanation. Uh, we have two sides of the company. The first one is the outsource CIO, where we support financial advisors in terms of uh, selecting the holdings they're going to use, the models that those holdings go into, and then of course, all the tools that are needed to build portfolios for their clients. Uh, we write their client emails, we do all their due diligence. We basically function as an in-source CIO to those advisors. Um, and then on the estate planning side, really, which is tagged up against financial planning, uh, we basically turned uh, estate planning to something that is a derivative of the advisor's office. So they can do all of that in-house, we do all the work, and it makes their financial planning uh, stronger and more valuable to their clients. So quick and easy idea of what we do in a nutshell. Perfect. <laughs> I'm excited about talking about a business that disrupts lawyers. So that's always a good thing in my book. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. We, we we did, we've done a lot of that. Here. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've met with, a, you know, we, we've done a lot of work with lawyers. We've, you know, we both Josh and I used to be in the uh, trust administration uh, industry, which was mm -hmm. primarily working with lawyers. And we've met a few good ones. Yes, yeah. there's a few uh, gems out there, but if you could disrupt oh, yeah. that market, that'd be great. A few. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, uh, yeah. you know, we, we, uh, not to jump ahead, but we, we, you know, lawyers in the estate planning world are super, super valuable for, you know, 20% of all mm -hmm. the trusts and estates that are out there. We got the other 80%. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a better slice Absolutely. of the pie to have. I mean, right. I'm right. I, I'm uh I'm kind of a foodie. I like having 80% of pie more than 20% of pie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how big the pie is. There is there is the law of diminishing sure. marginal returns. You have to uh that, the first bite of pie is not as good as the 50th bite of pie. Uh, I'm just telling you. Yeah, chocolate mousse would definitely fall in that like I'd probably rather have 20% uh, than 80. <laughs> right. Exactly right. Yeah. So for those of you that are listening to the podcast and uh not driving, I think we could play a fun drinking game with this one. Every time we make a nerdy math reference, you have to have to drink something, maybe a beer or a shot or something like that. I think there's going to be a lot of yeah. them today. We already had one, or actually two, quantitative analysis and law of diminishing returns. So we'll keep this going. Yes, we'll keep it going. <laughs> and if at the end we haven't done enough, yeah. we'll just say like five or six in a row, and you'll be really hammered by the That's time right. this is over. <laughs> you know, my, right. my, my, first, uh, my first introduction to – Law of diminishing returns from a from an educational standpoint was uh, uh, me in a high school classroom setting with my econ teacher and a plate full of donuts, and he made mm -hmm. me eat donuts until I was not willing to eat donuts anymore. It was like <laughs> the the demonstration to the class because I was I was yeah. the lineman, you know, and he was like, "Hey, you know, like eat another one." It was like you like donuts, I can tell. Yeah, just look I, at after you. after about like, like the yeah. eighth one, you're just like, <laughs> "I'm not paying you for another donut. I don't, I don't. You have to pay me to eat a donut." <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we had the same thing in college, but it was pizza. So yeah. same exact yeah. same exact example. Yep. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So so let's kick this thing off. Really, mm -hmm. you know, everyone. I hope you have like coffee, Excedrin, whatever you need for headaches. But let's kick this off with what is quantitative analysis? That's a big question. Um, the way I, I mean, there's lots of different types of it, right? So there's everything from high frequency trading all the way to long only retail, right? And we're kind of on the long only retail side of the analytic. It certainly, you know, you can aim technology at anything, but we've really specialized working with financial advisors, right? So limited number of options in terms of, you know, what you can actually have in a client portfolio, how frequently you can trade, things of that nature. So regardless of what type of quant you're talking about, it all kind of follows the same pattern. And that is you have um, every strategy, no matter what it is, is going to start with a bunch of smart people. And these smart people are all going to come together, they're going to say, here's an amazing idea. It's the greatest idea ever, right? Mm -hmm. And these thousands and thousands of ideas are going to be fully, fully researched. They're going to be back tested. They're going to try and break them, all kinds of stuff. 
And for every thousand ideas that come in, there's there's one maybe actual model, real life way of doing things that comes out of it. And that's where the fork in the road happens. Either number one, that fully researched capability can now go back and be given to the smart people. Now the smart people have to execute it. And that's where the human risk comes in. They get tired, lazy, bored, frustrated, fearful, whatever it is. Humans, when you have to ask them to do something repeatedly over and over again, especially in a in a highly volatile environment, they become completely unreliable. Um, so why would you want to take such a beautiful, fully researched capability and add all that risk to it, right? Mm -hmm. That's where the world of quant comes in. Quant comes in and says, okay, well, now we have this fully researched capability. Let's make sure we take all the execution risk out of it and do it over and over and over again and trust the process. Um, is it perfect? No, never going to be, but it's a heck of a lot better than adding a whole layer of human risk to it. So we like to talk about quant as being the best parts of humanity without the risks of humanity. Um, it's not exactly that, but we like it. It's a good tagline. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no. It's we are though. the best of humanity. <laughs> I like it. Without all the crappy parts. <laughs> without all the crappy parts, yes. Which is most yeah. of humanity. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, you know, how, you, you kind of came from a, a previous business, but what was it like to see that there was this market inefficiency and this huge niche that needed to be filled you know, in the quantitative analysis space for, for advisors? Because I know a lot of advisors, I'm one of them sometimes, and we're not that smart. So how did you, how did you figure that out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was it was something that was showed to me, uh, sh showed, shown. Uh, grammar <laughs> isn't yeah. quant, right? So Yeah, eh. I'm good at numbers, um, not words. Yeah. It, 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 it was really another advisor that came to me and said, here are the problems in our industry, and I think you can, I think you have a solution to one of them, which was, we don't have a high degree of confidence in what we're doing. It, we're chasing around trying to look good in front of our clients. But we have no idea if what we're actually doing is additive to the compound rate that we need to get the long run financial plan achieved. Um, we are not able to differentiate ourselves from other advisors because the story we tell is very professional, sounds good, but it sounds exactly like everyone else's. We use Morningstar, we have a process, we have an investment committee, we, you know, blow some fairy dust on it and voila, we put together this stuff for you. Um, but it sounds exactly like their pitch. So how do we differentiate ourselves? Because how do we get time and energy back so we're not having to deal with this? How do we make our staff more scalable and efficient um, so they're not touching completely unique files every single time? How do we get our practice to move as one? How do we reduce our regulatory compliance risk by having a quantitative or mathematic backbone for why we're making the prudent decisions? Um, you know, quant comes in and solves a lot of advisory problems that are out there, um, assuming that you're a type of advisor that values those types of things. There's a lot of advisors out there that, hey, there's a no value in asset management. I want the index, let it do what it does, and I'm going to add all my value on financial planning and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But that's exactly why fee compression is happening, because we make our money on basis points for managing money, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but that's the way, I mean, everyone has their little way of looking at the world. We're very convicted in the way that we look at ours. and um, you know, asset management touches a lot of big problems within finance, especially financial advisors. Yeah. So, so getting into this field, what, what were the first steps you had to take to, I, I mean, it's not like you're like, Hey, I'm going to start this, you know, quantitative analysis business. Uh, I need an office and a computer, right? I mean, it's, it's more than that, right? So what oh, yeah. were the first steps you took to where it's like, all right, I'm going all in on this thing and here, here's what I got to do. Yeah. Well, I, I got used to what you need to do uh, this type of analytics when I was at Columbia Threadneedle on their quant desk, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to learn how to write the, the code that's relative and relevant to our business. You have to get good at Bloomberg and and all the de the depths of FactSet and and Aladdin and Morningstar and, and all the different systems and technology that feed the data sets that come in. You also understand where the data pitfalls are. Once cloud computing came around, that was really the entry point for retail because you didn't have to have a server farm. I mean, back in the day, you'd have to, you know, write a bunch of code um, to run whatever analysis you wanted. Wait till everyone went home at night in whatever office building you were in, daisy chain all their computers together, go home, come back in the morning, and maybe you had an answer, right? <laughs> now you can do all of that times a thousand from a laptop on the beach. And so that type of hardcore computing power is now available across the board. So um, so that's changed, obviously, and, and made a lot of this stuff accessible. But um, yeah, clean data and fast processing is what's opened up uh, the capabilities to quant for, you know, uh, anybody really to get into it. That and you got to have a solid mathematic backbone. Mm -hmm. um, having gone through 
working on the institutional side, you get exposed to a lot of strategies that, that don't work, right? Um, not because we tried them, but because you analyze them. And one of the big problems that happens with retail advisors is they read a news article or something, they get an idea, they don't fully research it, they spend three years on something that is doomed, that there's no possible way it can work in the long run. And it takes so many iterations of that and so many losses of clients. Um, one of the great advantages of quant shops like ours is we've run millions of, in, of, of, um, of um, iterations of things. And so we've kind of washed away what we know doesn't work. And now it's about sticking to the things that have the highest statistical relevance, if you will, to success over the long run. That's a shot. Statistical relevance is a shot. <laughs> there we go. Boom. There we go. I, I don't have anything here. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, some of this stuff is, you know, it, it's fairly advanced. How, how did you get some of those people who are skeptics? How, how did you maybe explain this in, in uh, you know, little kid terms or, or break it down mm -hmm. into, you know, uh, uh, edible, you know, segments to where people could mm -hmm. understand? Because it, it is kind of, especially when you're talking about you know, money and, and managing money, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so I don't understand, you know, any of this. Why would I put my right. money there? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, there's some folks that no matter how hard I've tried over the years, you can't get them to, to come onto this side of the equation, right? Um, but for the folks that are open to it, mm -hmm. well, I think where really the, the understanding comes from is actually starting with the end result for the client. So what most financial advisors want is to look at their portfolio, which is basically a collection of accounts, and inside those accounts are generally models. And they say, I'm confident that if I make decisions this way, so that's the best chance I'm going to give my client achieving their long run goals. Okay. Now, if there was no such thing as a crisis, if there was no such thing as massive recessions that came along, we really wouldn't need asset management. You'd have a diversified portfolio mm -hmm. with the asset classes that, um, you know, make sense to that client and you let it just sit there. But the reality of it is, is that we can't do that all the time because if you just do nothing, we come across scenarios like 2000 and 2008 where we talk about lost decades, where a buy holder balance, modern portfolio theory type of approach, if you do nothing, you end up taking five years to recover. Mm -hmm. That permanently alters the financial plan, right? right? So if that's one of the core problems, let's assume that the main core problem is delivering on your promises to your client, then the question is, well, how do you build a portfolio that mitigates the risk of a, of a crisis coming along and altering our financial plan, but otherwise simply allows me to make use of the market as it grows. And that's really where the world of quant comes in. Humans can't necessarily hold multiple ideas in their head without an organization structure around it. So if you're building modern portfolio-based portfolios, then the whole thing is modern portfolio theory. If you're building trend-following portfolios, then the whole thing is trend-following. The problem is there's no one set of mathematics that works all the time. So if I'm 100% all in on one approach and that approach doesn't work, the whole portfolio gets set back maybe a decade. In our world, or how we begin explaining it is that you build something that we call a confident circle. So imagine a circle with arrows pointing in all directions around it, like a, like a compass pointing in all directions. When you build a portfolio out of quantitative principles, some of your portfolio is going to be looking for economic risk. Some of your portfolio is going to be looking for trend risk. Some of your portfolio is going to be looking for static risk. Some of it's going to be looking for behavioral risk. Some of it's going to be looking for contrarian risk or whatever it might be. And the easiest way to visualize that is um, elephants. So if you go on a safari, um, you're going to see elephants standing in a circle. They call that a defensive circle or a protective circle. They're looking for lions. In the middle is the baby elephant, right? If one of them sees an, a, a lion, they're gonna alert the rest of the herd. That's the same way to think about quantitative portfolio design. It's a lot of math or a lot of eyeballs looking in a lot of different directions for a lot of different risks. So that when one of them gets spotted, some or all of the portfolio can take protective measures to mitigate the risk of a crisis. That concept of different math looking in different directions, we can show increases your compound efficiency. In turn, your compound rate being the most powerful force in investing is what achieves the goals over the long run. And so that's, that's the, the conceptual story that people generally start with and say, okay, I see how using different quantitative approaches helps me be more confident about portfolios. 
Now let me learn about each one of these individual mathematic principles so that I'm comfortable there. And by that point, they're good. Mm -hmm. It just takes a little bit of commitment to getting that, that knowledge in the old bean. So. Now, now I'm reviewing our drinking game rules, and I'm not sure if we had uh, African safari elephant analogies mm. as a reason to take a shot, but we could throw that oh, in sure. there. Uh, for Any animal guests. reference going forward. <laughs> Yeah. I have a great car reference, if you want I, a car was... reference, too. Because, um, you know, you, you need examples to get things into people's heads, right? So when I, when I explain portfolios looking in different directions, like, what do you mean? But I explain, you know, animals defending their young. Oh, that makes sense suddenly, you know? Um, yeah. The exact same thing that you think about portfolios is the way that car engineers think about building a car. So I have to build a car assuming that it's going to get into a horrible accident at some point. And so therefore I build crumple zones so that if I take a head on collision, yeah, the front of my car is going to get messed up, but the people walk away without a scratch. How do you yep. build a portfolio that can take a beating on one side, but the financial plan stays intact? The same plan you had coming in is the same one you had leaving. And that's, that's another way to look at the way that mathematics works. So mathematics are your crumple zones. I know that if I have part of my portfolio looking at economics, and part of it looking at trend and part of it looking at behavior, that if we happen to get smashed on the economic side, because my whole portfolio wasn't looking at economics, my whole portfolio doesn't get smashed, right? right. That right. part did, but the rest didn't. And so the plan survives. And so there's lots of analogies that really come down to the same point. And that is that you can't build a portfolio out of one way of thinking. You need a framework and a structure that thinks in lots of ways, because you never know what the next crisis is going to look like. But yep. When there's not a crisis, all of those mathematic lenses need to look upward towards market growth so you're not sacrificing that. That's what our goal is as a company, and we're good at it. So, so Helios, the cyber truck of, uh, of quantitative analysis. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I can't wait to see someone drive down the road in a bright pink one or something. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I really want one now so that I can drop my kids off at high school in it. <laughs> and they can just be like... <laughs> Does your dad have one of those old, like the first electric truck ever? Like, yes, yeah. yes, I do. It's like it's <laughs> like the guys driving around in the big Hummers now. You know what I mean? It's like, well, it's like that was cool the first year they came out, but now it's not. It's kind of a symbol of I, you need a new car. <laughs> I kind of look at it as like the Cybertruck is the it's the truck if uh, you know an N sixty four actually produced a truck like yeah. <laughs> The spunky ankles. Well, uh, good the Nintendo craziest thing reference. about that, yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't think we'd get it. That's a drink for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, the 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 thing about the Cybertruck is, for the price point, the amount of torque you get out of that for towing is mind blowing. True. Yeah. I mean, the True. stats of that truck is awesome at that price point for sure, but it's just ugly in my opinion. <laughs> my opinion yeah, only. Obviously. Yep, I'm with <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. So when you're what did it take to get Helios from an actual concept? You know, obviously we can't talk about in the last episode that you kind of had to, but what was that? You're like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm jumping out. I'm taking the big leap and, and getting this thing going. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was a belief structure that, you know, I kind of, we kind of alluded to when I went on my little tirade there mm -hmm. at the end of the last episode. Um, you know, if you haven't seen that, you can, you can check out that rant, but um, it's, it's, what committed me to making the leap was number one, we, we did have some clients that I believe was going to allow me to come over and cash flow it. So mm -hmm. even though it was a, a scary couple of days, you know, should I, should I not? I knew that when I got there, it wasn't starting at zero. So, you know, in all fairness, I did have a little bit of a safety net. Um, but it's also just a very deep conviction in, in, the, in what we do in our little corner of the market. You know, there's never going to be a moment where, there's one completely ubiquitous way of thinking about asset management because it's it's a highly perspective-based thing that everyone has their own perspective on. And because we felt like we had, or I feel like I have my conviction on how money needs to be run, um, it allows us to have our niche, have the folks that, that that believe in what we do as well. And it's a great business to be in. It's very fulfilling. Um, so yeah. so for me, it's, it was pretty easy. You know, there wasn't a lot of ifs about what I was doing. It was, it was, incredibly planned out. So I think a lot of investors, or a lot of, uh, not investors, but entrepreneurs, you know, have some form of business that they just kind of wing it. That really wasn't this. I mean, it was years and years and years of building a conviction that, that ended up being something to monetize in a, in a, in a company. So.
So, so in that first year, did you have some things where you thought for sure, like, okay, it's, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to go this direction. And in that first year, you're like, you know what, that, you know, because I think that's also another thing with entrepreneurs is the first year is always rough. Mm-hmm. And you're not quite sure if it's just a matter of time or if you have to actually change directions. So what was that yeah. like for you? And did you guys end up changing directions a little bit or just wait it out? Yeah, we're kind of still in the middle of it. Um, the, the number one thing that, that I learned um, as I got deeper and deeper into retail is you can make a lot of really, really cool algorithms that do really, really cool things. But when the rubber meets the road and you have to make hard decisions, sometimes the decisions are too tough for the retail community. Um, and so we had to kind of back off the gas. We had to make execution easier for advisors to handle because in the institutional world, you're dealing with infinite timelines and you're dealing with, 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 with rational investors that are institutionally qualified. Dealing with mom and pop down the street that put their whole life savings with you and every time it goes up or down 1%, it's the end of the world. That's a different world. So there has been and continues to be a learning curve on really what models and what principles can be thrown out from a quantitative perspective that are that are manageable in a real life setting with retail advisors. And that's why we have such a wide number of models so that advisors can plug in in any way that, any way that they want to, but we still have to put some guardrails around them. And um, we, we learned that lesson in year one as uh, years have gone by, um, we've actually, um, so not to put a super big timestamp on this, but in Q2 of 2021, which is coming up here in a month and a half, we're going to be releasing what we call Ecosystem 2.0. And there's two gigantic problems in the world of models. The first one is, is that they're not customizable. And the second one is they're not adaptable or flexible once a crisis starts. And we've built the first set of algorithms that are completely customizable to the advisor up front. And then once a crisis happens, um, if, if the advisor wants, the pain point of the crisis can be identified and algorithms can be removed from their models if they choose. And so um, we're doing some cool stuff. Yeah, so Chris, obviously you're super passionate about this, but you know, how, how uh, much are you into the day-to-day of you know, writing the algorithms and running basically the quant side of it and actually running the business? Because that, you know, that's, you're a big business now, and how, can you do both? Yeah, no. Now we got a we got a good sized team. Um, so so Joe Mallon, who's my chief investment officer, and Jason Van Thiel, who's my director of research, super brilliant guys. They run all the day to day on the investment side of our business. Um, we match up on a daily basis to review. You know what are the algorithms doing? Um, you know what's everything saying? So that there's a high degree of communication between us, but they're generally pretty quick conversations and we have dashboards that allow us to see it. Um, plus a lot of times they tell me to get out of their business, you know, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cause I like to butt in with, what about this? And what about this? They're like, no. Um, but uh, it, so I spend a lot of my time just uh, working with our prospects, working with our existing clients and uh, kind of keeping a, a heartbeat on the industry doing podcasts like this. So I think slowly but surely they're trying to, you know, get me out of all day-to-day operations because I'm a bit of a tinkerer and uh, people hate that. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe maybe yeah. they got you that uh, snowboard behind you because they just be like, hey, Chris, just go. Get Mountains, out. get out get of here. The get mountain. out of here. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. going to be out there tomorrow. So hopefully I'm still here. Yeah, they're like, hey, Chris, you should take more vacations. <laughs> <laughs> like permanent ones. They're, yeah. they're paid yeah. vacations. Just right. go. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so let, let's talk about the growth too, right? So you guys, mm-hmm. you guys obviously started small, grew quick. Uh, mm-hmm. How did you guys? What, what was kind of your filter of like, hey, what do we outsource first, and how do we scale? Because I, you know, for uh, for entrepreneurs who do well, I mean, they're they're mm-hmm. the ones that are like, hey, I've got to do everything myself because I'm not making enough money. The other ones yeah. are like, we're getting inundated with business, and that can mm-hmm. be just as crippling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the major thing that we outsource is we do all the math in-house. We don't write any code in-house anymore. So um, the world of code um, and the different languages and the innovation on that end just is super fast. So we use developers um, that we outsource to uh, from a code perspective, even though, like I said, we do all the math in-house. Um, that's, the, that's the first one um, and the biggest one from us as a, as a quant shop. Um, but mostly it's been, and I kind of, you, 
you know, from our previous episode, we talked about, you know, if you could redo something, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I said was I would adopt technology earlier. And that's really where our scale and efficiency comes from. So, you know, you know, we influence, you know, north of 30 billion at this point. Um, and, you know, we're doing all of this with, you know, 12, 13 people as actual employees, um, because we, we leverage a lot of technology to make ourselves scale and efficiency official. So it's scalable and efficient. So we're not a, we're not a, our, our, our AU, our AUA, you know, what we influence in assets to our relative size is, you know, we're super proud of. So, so how, did you set out to build the business like that? Or does it just kind of happen because of the industry you're in or is, is that, how did that, how did that come about? Yeah. I mean, we, we, we really grew, uh, only on word of mouth. I mean, up until really 2020, we didn't do any advertising because we just naturally would, would be promoted. Um, so it kind of just has been really organic. Um, I didn't set out with any targets. There was no part of me that said, I want to be a $50 million company, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it, it's something where now we, we embrace our growth. But one thing that most people don't know about Helios is we limit our availability. So we'll only work with a certain number of advisors in any one given area. And once we're full, we're full. We do that because we don't want to create a a dilution of our value proposition to our advisor. Um, And so we we naturally will limit our growth to probably about two, three, four percent of all financial advisors out there because of our limitations. And so the people that we partner with see us as a partner, not a vendor. And that's just kind of one of the reasons why. So can, yeah. can you go over that in a little bit more detail? Because that, that's pretty interesting. You, so you choose yeah. to like really only per certain area, only have a small group of advisors you work with. Correct. And, yeah. and what was the, go, go over again the thought process as to why that would be more beneficial than saying, hey, let's get as many people on board as possible. Yeah. Well, I think it starts with the fact that we know that, that, that we, we target a certain specific type of advisor to work with. So we categorize advisors into three groups. The first group is what we call the analysts. We think that's about 25% of the advisors that are out there. And the analysts are, they sell products and performance, right? Their viewpoint on asset management is the ends justify the means. If it works, it works, right? Um, Whatever is kicking butt, I want to own it, right? And if I say I do asset management, they say, what were your returns, right? That's how they see the whole world. We call them analysts. Um, We do support a number of analysts. because we support large firms and some of the advisors might be analysts, but they're really not our target. Um, we're never going to be like drinking buddies with those guys, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they just see the world very differently than we do. About half of the advisors, I call them engineers, and they don't sell products and performance. They sell their time and their process. So they say, look, Mr. or Mrs. Client, you sit down, close your eyes. I'm going to put you in a 50-50 portfolio. 20 years from now, you're going to wake up. All your hopes and dreams will be, or, or, or will be, will be taken care of. Asset management has no value. It's a commodity. What makes it value, what makes this relationship valuable is me and my financial planning and my insurance and all these ways that I consult with you, right? I'm selling you my time and that is a transactional thing. So about half of advisors I put in that category. About 25% of advisors are what I call planners. And planners sell expertise in financial planning. They sell goals and a custom roadmap to get there. Every decision they make is filtered through, if I make this decision, will it help or hurt my odds of achieving that plan in the long run? And those are the advisors that we specifically support. Now, we support a lot of engineers. We support a lot of analysts. But the, our simpatico, our kind of blood brothers, those are the planners. And so we built our whole company around that. So we know we only have a subsection to work with. Um, and so that makes it easy for us to go into an area, identify, okay, we got a million people in this area. We'll work with maybe five teams in this area. Yeah, they might run across each other from time to time, but, um, but they won't trip over each other. And we don't dilute our value proposition to them. So we feel like it's our part as a, as a partner to not just dilute what makes them have a competitive advantage in their area. Yeah. Right. Well, so, Josh and I, for uh, compliance reasons, will probably just refrain from commenting on those three categories. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have My opinions. Opinion only. We do have opinions on the three that you discussed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, Chris. You know, as a business owner, when you're getting this up and running, what did you decide to keep in house, and what have you outsourced, and how have you kind of what was your thought process on those at Helios? Yeah, definitely. So one of them I mentioned was the um, was the outsourcing of all the code and development on that end. Uh, that's the big one. Um, everything else we have more or less kept in house. Um, we did bring in some design help, such as for websites uh, and things of that nature, on a project basis. 
but um, but we run pretty lean as a company. Um, you know, most of our of our folks are in um, the asset management piece of it, um, um, and then we have a few folks in sales, a uh, few in customer service. But we really haven't had to outsource much. Um, but we we wouldn't be afraid to if it ever came down to it. Um, but really, it's the development and code that's the major piece at this stage. Yeah. And by staying lean like that, and by by limiting your your you know the the amount of people you'll work with in any given group, um, ha- have you guys been able to limit that threat of growing too fast in a certain area, or or was there a time where you guys were growing so fast that you were a little worried that like, hey, is this sustainable? Are we are we about ready to get toppled? Yeah, um, we we have had that experience. I think every small business does at some point because. You, you go through little growth spurts. Um, so we did, we went through an element of time where we grew a little bit too fast. And where that really hit us was, you know, when, you, when you're educating advisors about quant, you're really setting their expectations of what it's gonna do. And when you grow too fast, you can't spend the time with each advisory team that you would want to make sure that their expectations get completely set. And um, so when we, we went through some growth spurts where we had to kind of come back around and say, hey, let's just make sure we trained you up right just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so it ended up being a little bit of rework from us, but we ended up building technology. So we built a learning management platform um, that serves as a repository for, you know, all of our video training and all of our um, our samples and 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 stuff like that. So um, we got a good, we're in a good spot now, but yeah, we certainly pre, you know, developing that technology, as mentioned, uh, we grew a little too fast for sure. Yeah. So. I guess shifting over in, you know, away from the quantitative side, but then you guys also were like, Hey, we want, you know, we don't want to just be a disruptor in this, uh, asset management world. We want to disrupt mm-hmm. another industry. You know, you yeah. kind of talk about, uh, you know, your categories of advisors. Now you got your categorizes, uh, you know, categories of, uh, state planners. What <laughs> was the catalyst that got you guys into, um, that got you guys into, uh, doing Helios integrated planning? Uh, and, yeah. and give us a quick snapshot of what Helios Integrated Planning is. Yeah, so so if you think about Helios Quantitative Research, now we're all under the same umbrella, but we just have uh-huh. different you know brands. But um, so Helios Quantitative Research was about kind of disrupting the way that asset management gets done, right? And mm-hmm. you know thinking about it differently than just returns, 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 right? And putting a framework around that documentation. Um, but that was on the asset management side of a business. And I've always looked at financial advisors having three pill or three pillars, right? The asset management pillar the financial planning pillar, and then kind of the protection and insurance pillar, right? And, um, and so I was like, well, how, do, how does Helios become relevant in more than just one pillar? And I had been thinking about things that, what are things that advisors are not monetizing? And there was a handful of them. One of them was estate planning. It just so happened that a buddy of mine um, was an estate planner that worked with a lot of advisors that I knew. And one day we ran into each other at a Memorial Day party and, I said, hey, what's going on? You know, and he goes, well, not much. I, um, you know, I just was working this morning, putting some, you know, estate plans together. I said, oh yeah, how long were you working? And he goes, well, I'm able to put together an entire estate plan in about 22 minutes. I'm like, don't you charge like 3,000 bucks for one of those? He goes, yeah, it's a great business to be in. And I looked at him and I said, I'm going to automate you. You can be in it or you can fight against it. What do you want to do? And he thought I was kidding. And so we kind of BSed about what it would look like to bring kind of affordable, super high quality estate planning to the masses, basically. Mm -hmm. And the next day he called me and he goes, I'm in, what do we got to do? And so um, so we basically kind of documented what are the big problems that advisors face in terms of um, needing to show more value in the financial planning process, uh, driving more revenue streams in the face of fee compression and so on and so forth. And the combination of, you know, there's you know, 100 million Americans out there that if you look at the percentages of population and those that say they need an estate plan that aren't being serviced in this area. And one of the reasons is it takes too dang long. It's really expensive. Um, and they don't necessarily trust this person. They do trust their advisor. So we combine the two problems together and said we can get all these estate plans done for people who need them. And we can drive a, a lot more value and revenue to advisors. And if we can create all these kinds of win-wins, then we got a successful business. So I, I was told this three days ago. I have not independently verified it, but we launched that about a year and a half ago. And um, and I was told that we are now the largest estate planning company in the nation. So it's kind of wow. a cool little treat. Yeah. There you yeah, go, baby. I haven't been able to verify this on my own, but I liked hearing it. So. <laughs> Second legal Zoom. 
yeah. <laughs> so it's um yes. Yeah, so it's been a great ride so far and um took a bit of investment up front, I'll tell you that much, which is something new for me to putting out that kind of uh -huh. kind of investment as an entrepreneur, but it paid off. So, great. Which I I mean it is great cuz I mean Josh and I have, you know, we we've looked at people and said like, "Hey, you probably should have an estate plan put together, right?" And and uh that $3,000 bill for some people, they just can't stomach that. And so if you can do it in a more innovative way, I mean, the, the other benefit is people who need plans are actually getting plans at a price point in which they'll, they'll, they'll stroke that check, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah because... we're charging a fifth, a tenth of that in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, so highly effective, but, but in, I would argue to you, higher quality. I mean, every financial advisor has cracked open a trust from an attorney and seen the wrong name in it yeah. or, you know, misspelling or all kinds of stuff. Well, again, when you introduce the worlds of algorithms to this, all that human error goes away, right? Yeah. Is it perfect? No, but it's far more effective than, you know, some guy doing his 15th estate plan for the day, going blind in front of Microsoft Word. Um, you know, all that risk goes out of it. Mm -hmm. And as someone who uh, questionably has a third grade spelling efficiency, um, I, you know, <laughs> Taking the human element out of it for me is huge because I mean, like I, yeah. swear, I I joke with with Josh. I'm like I have I have misspelled the word entrepreneur so many times, and that's all we talk to. <laughs> just like ah, well, and it's getting worse. You know, just like GPS, I don't know how to get anywhere anymore. I'm completely dependent on it. now. I'm completely dependent on spell check. Oh yeah, or autofill. Yep, that's my yeah, word. Yeah, that's yep. what I want. <laughs> my my wife laughs whenever like she'll see me texting, and then she'll just see me do the voice to text like restaurant and that's that's usually me <laughs> typing it so bad so many times that it won't even guess what i'm trying to do and i'm like eh. you started it with a z yeah. <laughs> instead yeah. of an r yeah, yeah. just like yeah i'm i'm done my fat pudgy fingers are not are not you know texting and i can't right uh, so, so chris what is it like been disrupting the old stodgy lawyer estate planning world because you're doing that right and what kind of pushback yeah. have you gotten and don't worry, you're not gonna ha you're not gonna have to answer to them because to listen to this, they're gonna have to download an app and you know. So so I <laughs> think the old guys you're disrupting are not gonna hear this. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's been surprisingly supportive from the estate planning community. There's a few that we run across that um, you know aren't so pleased uh, that we're in this industry, but we're not the first ones here, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned LegalZoom came into this area before. Um, I think what's been really interesting, or like I say to advisors, is that when we come into an advisory office. We're not getting rid of your estate planner relationships that you have locally. There's a lot of complex needs, such as they want to disinherit a child, or you know they want to, you know, uh, they have someone with questionable mental capacity, or you know any number of different reasons that are complex. And our system actually makes you answer a few questions like that in advance of doing the estate plan. And if you say yes to them, it's going to tell you don't do this plan through us. Give it over to a local attorney that can spend 20, 30 hours with these people and break down all of their needs and do it in a way that is more time than an advisor is going to want to spend here, right? Even though we have the capability of doing the most complex plans, we don't want the advisors involved with those. So it's really about the 80% of plans that aren't complex. And most of those are never going to get done by an attorney, mm -hmm. right? Because they're too expensive to take too much time and so on and so forth. So we're really doing the plans that otherwise never would have gotten done. Yeah, there's some overlap with attorneys. But the attorneys are going to still do the attorney level work they need to. We don't want that business. Um, you know, we're going to do the stuff that's, you know, the other 80 percent. So um, it's been a good working relationship with most attorneys we've come across. Every once in a while, you find one that's, you know, not so happy with us. But yeah. that's the nature of disruption. Their attorneys. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Get off my lawn, yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say, bo both the you know quantitative uh, analysis side and, and the, the Helio side I mean, or, or um, the, the estate planning side are, are taking off. Well, what's kind of your, you know, as someone who is obviously an innovative thinker and had a vision for this stuff, where do you kind of see Helios uh, five you know, or 10 years down the road? Yeah, yeah. I thought a lot about that recently. Um, one of the things that's really exciting on our end is we are about to release the first phase of a software platform called Helios Tools. And Helios Tools uh, in its first iteration is really an analytics engine, right? Taking in uh, you know, client accounts and all the holdings that are inside of it, and then doing all the comparison and analytics work to um, you know, a, a, a benchmark or a model or something of that nature. And a lot of 
client-friendly and really in-depth analysis that unless you have some very expensive subscriptions, you're never going to get. Um, this first phase of Helios tools and all that analytic firepower, we're going to be giving away completely and totally free to any advisor who wants it. Sign up, log in, and um, that's number one, right? We're going to keep adding on to this software technology, and we want Helios tools to be a free, um, open, and powerful hub for portfolio analytics that helps advisors that want to bring more quant into their space do it totally free of charge. What that will also do is it will perform a chassis for us or for Helios quantitative research clients. It will allow, also allow us to build the first AI driven, essentially practice manager. So what it will allow us to do is have client advisors upload uh, all their models, all their, every holding in their book, um, essentially have the AI learn about how that advisor wants to behave and how they think about the world and then watch their book second by second to make sure that anything and everything at the model holding or thought process level can be alerted and documented and handled so that the highest levels of regulatory and compliance is handled for the client uh, or for the advisor and so on and so forth down the road. So a lot of technology coming out of our space that in five years, we, we really hope to have some form of a technology relationship with you know, literally every financial advisor out there, one form or another. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we're doing on the technology end that's both free to the world and something that benefits clients of just ours. Um, and I, at some point in time, I do want to do something on the tax side. I think tax and um, uh, consulting and management has a lot of room to go. And um, so we're going to turn our attention there as soon as we get a little bit of uh, some of these projects behind us. But um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt seeing us there in a few minutes. So. I, I am I am uh, staying tuned Let's for that. It. We're gonna have we're gonna have a, an episode three as soon as you launch that puppy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I, I heard taxes might be important in the coming years. I don't know. I just might be a rumor. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Maybe maybe not. I don't yeah. know. Yes. Yes. Not a pay the government whatever they ask. It's going to a good cause. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely right. So, um, so, you know, everyone trusts the government to be efficient with our tax dollars. So I really don't know what the problem yes. is. One hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, Yep. Next question. <laughs> um, so, hey, so, Chris, we're going to end the episode there. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about or we, want, we can dive in? And uh, where can people find, find you and Helios and, and all the awesome stuff you guys do? Yeah, the easiest way to find us is, um, first and foremost, you can always email me. I don't know if we're going to post that or whatnot, but um, email yeah. address is uh, chris.shuba, S-H-U-B-A, at heliosdriven.com. Even easier than that is uh, we have two websites right now. We have heliosdriven.com, H-E-L-I-O-S-D-R-I-V-E-N.com, and we have heliosplans.com. So um, Helios Plans is the estate planning. Helios Driven is the uh, quantitative analysis side of us. Uh, eventually, we will have one website, and it'll be up and running pretty quickly here, and that's just helios.solutions. So uh, helios.solutions will be the – if you asked me this question in like a month, that's what I would have told you. But yeah. <laughs> it's uh, um, we got lots of websites. So, We're going to consolidate we'll, them all together. We got all kinds of we'll, stuff. We'll be on. posting this episode in about a month or two months. So I mean, he, he oh. does, yeah, we're we're good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Perfect. But um, yeah. I mean, if uh, if you just Google Helios quantitative research or Helios integrated planning, we come up. So uh, it's not too hard to find us if you're looking. Uh, that's for sure. So awesome. All right, Mark. Speed round. You ready to do it? If as a business owner, as an entrepreneur with a growing business, the first thing that you look to outsource as you were scaling up, what was the first mm -hmm. thing that you're like, this drags me down as a business. I've got to get someone else to do this work. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the code was the thing that we outsourced. But on a personal level, um, for me, the first thing I hired was a COO, someone who's good at managing a business, um, which was the greatest thing ever. So two answers for you in the speed mm -hmm. round. No, perfect. We had, we, had a, we had a past guest who lost a business and his thing that he said was, he was like, if, if I were to save that business, it would have been because I hired a COO and took myself out of the equation. You know, he yep. was like, I just, you know, there's some people that are better at that stuff and that would have, that probably would have saved the business. Yep. So yep. good exactly advice. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you have uh, a week, no phone, no email, nothing like total technology cut off. Where are you going to hang out? Oh my gosh. If I'm going for a week 
no technology, no nothing whatsoever. Uh, this is totally mood based. I'm sure this would change all the time, but I would probably just, um, I'd be in like, uh, I'd be in uh, Vail or some really little cool mountain town. I'd, grab, I'd take my snowboard off the back and I would just kind of board out for a week and do the mountain life. Yeah. You ask me this in the summer, I'll probably tell you something different, but right now it's, it's that. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and then and lastly, you know, the postponed Olympics are coming up. Do you have a particular <laughs> event you're super excited for or, or uh, um, uh, any, any athletes you're watching? Well, the, it's the summer games, right? In yeah. Tokyo that was postponed, postponed from last year. Yeah. I have some funny stories about that, but, um, but as a, as a former college sprinter, I would, uh, I always like to watch the 100 meter dash, man. It's the f- most fun 10 seconds in all of sports, in my opinion. It so, is. uh, that's what yep. I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Especially being awesome. from the U.S. where we don't lose too many of those. Uh, yeah. No, we uh, don't. Yeah. Usain uh, Bolt's out now, so that's, that makes it a little easier for us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember in, uh, in 96 when Canada won the 4 by 100 um, And it was the first time, I think, in the modern Olympics. Don't, this might not be 100, but I think it is the first time that the U.S. 4 by 100 team ever lost. And um, we were in, and, and at the time for another story in another lifetime, I was actually at the U S Olympic training center uh, in Colorado Springs eating uh, lunch when the race was on. And we were all there. All of us that were there um, were watching like, Oh, Hey, here comes another gold. And then we lost. And like, you could hear a pin drop. Like it was, it was a stained memory, but anyway, I digress. Different story for a different time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you yeah. so much for being on the show. We are, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're really excited to watch you guys grow. I mean, Josh and I have been watching uh, Helios for, for, you know, probably two years now, uh, at least a year. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just excited. We're excited to see your guys' uh, growth. Excited to, especially excited to hear that tax side as that develops. And uh, <laughs> you're going to yes. have a free, you're going to have a toolkit with free stuff. I am all about free stuff. If you throw on a t-shirt, that's like my favorite thing. Free t-shirts yeah. are the best. So. Oh, um, we, we got lots of t-shirts, but you know, what we need from, from viewers out there is we need to know what's broken uh-huh. in the tax world. Right. And the more we can aggregate that problem and really hang on, hang on in it, you know, building the math around fixing, it's pretty easy, but it's really getting that problem rooted out. So yeah. let's work on that. Perfect. Yep. Right. Well, well, thanks so much. Awesome. Uh, uh, real quick, nothing we said here can be taken as tax legal or financial advice. So please, if something's not interesting, Go search for a go to your CPA, go to your attorney, go to uh, uh, your financial planner or investment advisor. Go, uh, I'm sure you could contact Helios and ask them questions as well. So, don't do anything without uh, you know professional guidance first. Uh, thank you everyone for um, you know this episode, and, and thank you everyone for listening. And we can't wait for uh, next uh, our next episode.